Bienvenidos, and welcome back to Puro Pinche Gol, the place where we discuss all things USMNT y la Selección Mexicana. My name is Adrian, joining me once again my co-host, Tocayo. Adrian, Adrian, how are you this Sunday afternoon? Hey, what's up, man? I'm doing all right. Kind of sort of uh, still digesting those losses from yesterday. <laughs> it wasn't an easy thir- uh, Saturday, not Thursday. Saturday, but all things considered, getting ready to do a post-match, dude. Yeah, uh, we definitely wanted to get our thoughts together before we did our post-match on these two matches. Um, definitely a lot to talk about. So let's get into it. We'll start off this video with the USMNT versus Colombia post-match reactions. And then the second half of the video will be Mexico versus Brazil uh, post-match reactions. We'll have um, down in the description the uh, timestamps to where each one starts so that you can uh, go to your uh, preferred uh, listening uh, destination there. But uh, USA, Colombia, man. Um, overall, 5-1. <laughs> Thumping of Greg Berhalter's team. The team looked disorganized. The team looked lazy the team looked like it didn't want to be there um colombia being you know ranked 12 in the fifa rankings uh now on a 22 win streak um you know did i think colombia could have played at 50 percent of their best and could have easily won this match that's how poor the usa was credit to colombia colombia did a fantastic job they even when their subs came in they kept going they didn't uh, take their foot off the gas and uh they got a deserved 5-1 win um but yeah uh now triple g is uh five seven six against top 20 teams four of those wins are against mexico so he's really one seven six one win uh seven draws six losses only other win against a top 20 team coming against iran in that world cup so he really has a 7.1 win percentage if we exclude mex against uh top 20 teams horrible percentage against top 20 teams um before we get more into analysis Adrian, why don't you give us a usmt starting lineup for this uh, colombia match yeah, dude. I think we pretty much. I think we were almost spot on on the things that we predicted with Mark Turner on the keep uh, on the goalie, uh, Joe Scally, Chris Richards, Team Ream, and Anthony Robinson. We had Weston McKinney, Jonathan Cardoso, and uh, Gio Reyna. And then up front, you had Team Wea, Follerin Balogun, and Christian Pulisic. I think, with the exception of Scally, maybe. Yeah, then um, we had Scott Shaq Moore, and we had mm-hmm. uh, Tyler Adams. Yep. So pretty close to our you know expected lineup um but i assume that tyler Adams didn't play because of you know i guess just trying to bring him back into form as easy as possible or as low as possible and i assume greg decided on scally over just because he plays in bundesliga and not uh in the mls but what is put on man i mean it's not difficult with the usmnt i think (laughs) yeah um and i think uh you know we started the match Pretty high, hyped up because there was a stat that came out that this was the first time that all USMNT players in the starting 11 uh, played in top five European leagues. So that, you know, Ian gave us more hype for the match. And, uh, you know, we were full of, um, you know, confidence going into this match, not thinking that the USMNT was going to dominate and maybe win 5 1, but uh, thinking the USMNT was going to put up a fight. USMNT was going to learn a lot of, um, you know, last minute details, uh, you know, just to fix little things here and there. Um, and maybe tie 2-2. You were thinking the USMNT would win, maybe 2-1 or something. Um, but no way did we predict this uh, 5-1 loss. Um, you mentioned Scally. I think he was maybe one of the only, I guess, positives. You could call it a positive, neutral maybe. Um, I think he did decent against Luis Diaz, uh, better than we thought. We, that we had mentioned that that was going to be one of the um, points to watch, how he, he uh, manned that flank. Um, but I think he did well. Um, but other than that, everybody else looked lost, looked uninterested, looked um, just like this is the first time you, you you put it perfectly well. You know when you when you we were putting together the agenda when you put together the agenda, um, this looked like the first time they were playing together, and uh, yeah. it, it it sure did look and feel that way. Mm-hmm. So I, I I wasn't able to watch the the full first half because um, I was having issues with my internet. But as soon as I was able to pick it back up, I mean I watched the entire uh, second half and then I rewatched some of the first half. And listen, man, I I think you put it really well when you say that they just look completely disconnected. I don't know what was going on. It just didn't seem that they had been playing for the last four years together. This is one of those things that we normally give praise to the USMNT that they know so they know each other so well that you know they complement each other and they, they work as a unit. But this match was just completely far from that specific statement. Uh, poor ball retention. Uh, two goals came from, you know, wrong pass deliveries or lost possessions. I mean, it was just, it, it just seemed like they, they were coming into this match cold as they could be. Yeah. And they've already had over a week in camp together. Mm-hmm. Plus they've been playing together for five years. Like you said, um, you know, I, uh, triple G, he has to be held accountable for this. Um, 
he's been coached now for six years, I guess five years, if you exclude that one year where they were looking for a coach, right? Yeah. Um, how is the team still looking for its identity? You know, he always mentions, oh, we're still looking for our identity. You know, we're still building, uh, you know, building. We're still trying to get together and, and yeah. create this this uh, this this process, a word he likes to use so much, process, yeah. identity. Um, I don't know. That's all BS to me, man. You've had the team for five years already. <laughs> uh, any other, you know, decent coach would have already, you know, put an identity together to this team yeah. right now. Um, and, yeah, it just, it, it just looked, you know, probably the, one of the worst games we've seen from the USMNT, especially um, – mm-hmm. Based off of the hype that was there after, you know, winning three Nations League in a row, I, I guess USMNT is just good at beating Mexico. <laughs> and, that, and you know, that's one of the points is here is that um, it just feels that, me- that you, the USMNT turns up only when, when they're facing Mexico, right? Um, they have had, for, for over the tenure of Triple G, they have had plenty of opportunities to just show up and let the world know that they, they are a force to be reckoned with, right? Maybe they're not necessarily... Uh, World Cup uh, winning championship team just yet, but they should be at least a dark horse contender, right? At least a, a team that, you know, all, all things considered, can make a push for the semifinal or can make a push for the top eight in a World Cup competition. But every single time they have the international stage like this, like yesterday with Colombia, who is a very challenging uh, side to to face up with, um, they, they are pretty much in third right now in, in the Comebol uh, World Cup qualifying rounds. Um, and I, I, they had like a 20 plus on beating uh, game streak, as you said. Uh, this was a great example, at least to just, you know, let everyone know that, hey, we're not going to take this lightly. We're here to actually mean to mean business and we're going to take we're going to take the bull by the horns. And it's just, you know, it didn't happen. If you're someone who's, who's looking at the match and you only take in consideration the stats, right? You can say, all right, it wasn't necessarily a, a you know, one sided match. It was pretty leveled, you know, almost around the same number of shots. Although when you, you know, when you look at shots on target, there's a big dif- discrepancy between two of the USMNT and six or eight from Colombia. But all, all things considered, you look at it and it's like, all right, it seems like, yes, maybe the USMNT was uh, less of a challenge than Colombia throughout the match. But then you look at the score and it's 5-1 and it's like, oh, what, what happened here? <laughs> what, what's, what's, the big, what's, the, what's the thing that I'm missing, right? What is the, what is the situation and what, what's the big uh, gap between these two teams that makes Colombia pretty much liberate you five to one. Yeah, I, 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 I really don't think there's a huge difference between, you know, the quality of players uh, when you go name by name. Yeah, no, I, I don't think so either. Uh, like we said, the CU-17 was starting 11 all in top five European leagues, but definitely the um, the battle was lost in midfield. Uh, Weston McKinney was absent the whole match. Johnny Cardoso had so many gi- unnecessary giveaways. Gio Reyna, I can't even remember any, you know, chance he created going forward. Um, it really, it really was lost in midfield. Balogun wasn't, you know, anywhere near his top form, anywhere near that, you know, those first couple of performances we saw him for the USMNT. He's still yet to find his form again after a very mediocre season at Monaco. And, um, to be fair to him, he wasn't fed much. You know, there was that one early chance in the beginning where he went over the post, um, and a couple others, but that was about it. Um, and, uh, I want to kind of also highlight the center backs. I think Chris Richards, I mean did okay i guess i don't know uh tim ream was the real one that i kind of wanted to highlight here um he looked old now he looked slow yeah age really did come out and um when carter rickers came in he didn't look any better man um carter rickers obviously the usmnt was losing at that point but um he didn't show me anything that kind of said oh you know this is a yeah. Tim Ream replacement i've seen better performance uh performances from zimmerman and miles robinson <laughs> honestly um that especially <laughs> especially <laughs> distribution and you know and passing out the back i think uh, miles and yeah. zimmerman were better than what Carter Vickers did last night. Um, but yeah, I mean, very quiet performances from some of uh, USMNT's, you know, better players. And uh, I think Pulisic was decent the first half. He was maybe the only one creating anything or trying to create anything. Uh, but other than that, man, a, a wasted opportunity for the USMNT to kind of uh, yeah. show up. And um, now we're left again after I, this is so annoying to me about USMNT. It's like, you know, roller coaster. Hi, we beat Mexico. Everybody's, you know, yay. And then the real USMNT shows up against any other team named not named Mexico. <laughs> and you're left like hashtag fire triple G again. Yeah, um, I know. I mean, and we didn't even mention Matt Turner, who had a horrible night. Oh, well, I guess horrible oh my God. showing. Yeah, yeah it, poor guy, man. I mean, I, his form is not getting any better. He got dropped by Nottingham Forest. I think it's maybe time for Triple G to reconsider having Horvat as a starting keeper. Maybe we should see him at, against Brazil, but it's just that it was not a good day for um, 
for Matt Turner. And the, the other red flag that I saw here is, I didn't know this, maybe, and maybe you you have more context on this, but I wasn't I wasn't aware that Pulisic had a cap playtime for the USMNT. Um, you know, I had I had read something about that, but uh, maybe it was just precautionary for for these two matches because I can't see that being the case at all for Copa America. The actual yeah, I, I mean, you know, I was I did some light research on it, and I just couldn't see or fi- find anything. That is specifically detail how many how many minutes he can play or if he came from Milan. I mean, we know that he's a very prone injury or injury prone player. Even though that with this season with Milan, he wasn't necessarily injured a, a lot. Um, it, it just it just to me is a red flag because he's arguably your best player right now. And if you're not if, if you can only count on him for like sixty minutes, then you have to be able to have a whole different strategy when he's on and off the pitch. And yesterday, what we saw with Triple G's uh, substitutions, it was just pretty much, you know, position by position and no no difference or, uh, I guess, uh, any signs of adaptability to what was going on, man. So, yep. yeah, I mean, I don't really want to keep on beating on, on a dead horse. I guess, yeah, is it beating on a dead horse or yeah. beating on, yeah, on a very tired horse, I guess. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's a... Uh, it was just interesting to see this poor performance from the USMNT. I think it's been a while since I felt that they've done this bad. Not even against the Netherlands in the World Cup, I felt this way. Yeah, and um, yeah, because you, you, you just get the feeling that it's the team's stagnating now. Uh, real real uh, quick back, you brought up Matt Turner. Um, I agree with you, man. Uh, you know, this is the first time maybe since I've been following the USMNT that you, it feels like the USMNT has trouble in the goalkeeping situation. They've always had a decent or really good goalie, some a solid yeah. goalkeeper that you can count on. And now it's like, it feels like, you know, even Horvath or who's other guy, Sean Johnson, that they brought as the backup, uh, you know, it, it's a weak, weak spot, very weak spot for the USMNT. And mm-hmm. uh, I think after Copa America, it's time to start transitioning to Slonina as the number one um, for 2026. Uh, you know, uh, there's rumors that Matt Turner is heading back to, the, uh, to MLS. Um, so... And even after post-match, Matt Turner said, and I quote, I think everybody needs to look into the mirror after that game. It really, really disappointing in front of such a great crowd. So I want to apologize to the fans as well. Um, look into the mirror and what? <laughs> they, they, they always seem to say that after a big loss. Look into the mirror, look into the mirror. Look into, and I, I, dude, play better. Um, I know it's a metaphor and everything. They're not literally looking into the mirror. But um, just say y'all played like crap. Um say that you know this is like what are we gonna do to fix this right no, i don't know man it, it's really annoying performance um and just goes to show that uh this team has against big teams stagnated for sure hopefully it's just the result of this being a friendly and the team didn't take it too serious um didn't want to reveal much of their strategy i don't know i'm trying to stay hopeful here but um they play brazil on wednesday uh and uh According to rumors, it's going to be Brazil's A team, not really the the the, the bench that played against Mexico. Yeah. So this could be another route, another you know three nil, four nil win or loss for USMNT, and uh, could play big, heavily on their minds going to the tournament for morale, for confidence. So uh, they need to get a result against Brazil definitely. And um, after that performance, I'm not sure they could get one. <laughs> Come on, man. Well, I mean, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. I was gonna say, you know, you gotta believe, but I, I don't think I don't think I'm gonna say. I, I don't think I, I can ask you to believe after that five five one uh, loss. It was. I think that five one loss is worse than Mexico's four zero loss in Uruguay. Oof, honestly, that's a bold, that's a bold statement. Mexico bold lost statement. with their with a team of random youngsters. Uh, it, it's not even Mexico's official U twenty three team. That's the team that's playing in the uh, tournament in France. This is a team yeah. of nothing of uh, Liga MX youngsters. Mekis. That have never played together on the big stage and lost four 0 to pretty much I want to say eight or seven or eight uh, of the Uruguay starting eleven were their starters. Mm-hmm. Um, so to lose four 0 with your youngsters under twenty three youngsters against a more or less Uruguay starting eleven is now that I have more time to reflection on that match. <laughs> uh, like I understand it, it's still disappointing, but I understand it. This is a lot more disappointing than that because this is your A team yeah, that has been playing together for six years, um, mm-hmm. losing five one and just looking disinterested, looking. Um, like they didn't want to be there, looking horribly, you know, in distribution out the back. Uh, so even when they were given possession, they didn't know how to break down Colombia. And it was just yeah. a very, very bad, bad performance. And I, the last thing I want to mention is, man, the USSF has, has to pick up some slack and uh, or pick it up because that was a full Colombian uh, audience, dude. Like the, the entire stadium was packed with Colombian people. Very, you, can, you, can, you rarely saw like a USMNT shirt or a US shirt. Um, this just cannot keep on happening. It just can't. I mean, 
I wouldn't have wanted to be there for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, as a USMNT, if I were a USMNT supporter, I'd be like, yeah, I'm glad I didn't go. You know? I know, but I mean. <laughs> I, I, I know. I, I, I get your sentiment for sure. They can't just fill out Columbus, Ohio and Cincinnati and, and be happy with that. They got to be able exactly. to show up for other, other parts of the country, mm-hmm. especially Washington, yes. D.C. I know. I wasn't expecting that big of a crowd from Colombia at that spot, but I guess there's a lot of Colombians around there. I read that uh, from a Colombian that posted that he goes to every US, every Colombia match in the country, no matter where it is, because oh. Colombia doesn't come to the US so frequently. And yeah, Colombia okay. so far that he doesn't travel to Colombia. And when he does, he doesn't go to a match in Colombia. So it's like, this is the only chance I get to see Colombia. So I'm going to go, you know, no matter if they play in Florida, in Washington, in Here we go. You know, Washington State, you know, anywhere. Here we go. But um, yeah, that's another topic. But uh, yeah, let's get to. Disappointing match for you, T, but uh, let's do the analysis now for uh, Mexico. All Mexico, right. Mexico uh, lost ultimately 3 2 to Brazil. A Brazil team, as we mentioned, that um, wasn't necessarily their A team, but it was more or less their bench for what they're going to bring to the Copa America, which is still a strong team. Um, you know, they, have, they still have the likes of Martinelli on that team, Allison, their goalkeeper, um, Luis Militao. Oh, yeah, just a. A team that you know is always it's Brazil, right? I mean, you you, you know you're going to get a good team no matter what they they put. Even though this is maybe Brazil's um, weakest team um, of recent years, still in transition yeah. with their new coach and uh, you know no Neymar. This is in the team of '98 to 2002 when they had Ronaldinho, you know uh, yeah, Ronaldo, all those guys, Rivaldo. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we go on, <laughs> uh, but still, uh, I think decent score. But we'll get into it, uh, you know, after we go through lineups. What was the lineup for Mexico man for for this match? All right, love for Mexico. We, I guess, maybe I was a little lost, but we have Julio Gonzalez, which was normal. Uh, you know, the the evident option after Luis Angel Malagón got dropped. Israel Reyes as a right back. I was surprised to see that. Uh, Edson Alvarez as a center back. Another surprise for me. Johan Vasquez and Gerardo Ortega on the left back, and then you have Luis Chavez, Luis Romo, and Charlie Rodriguez in the midfield. Then you uh, at the very top you have Uriel, Uriel Antuna, Santi Jimenez, and Julian Quinones, which we ultimately expected for this match. Yeah, uh, I think the big points of, of talk here are, you know, the the right side of the defense, Antonio Alvarez as center, right center back, and mm-hmm. uh, Luis Reyes as right back, Israel mm-hmm. Reyes, sorry, and um, definitely Charlie Rodriguez has been a point of talk uh, amongst yeah. USMNT uh, and Mexico fans here. Um, the fact that he has 50 caps with a selection and only has one assist um, speaks volumes <laughs> as to how he's been performing for, for yes. entry, and yes. could be why Santi Jimenez looks so lost and looks so without support that whole match um you know commentators like to and you know uh, uh analysts, analysts like to kind of try to figure out why Santi Jimenez has such a poor uh, record for Mexico scoring wise but man even after yesterday's match he does not get any support up there any any no. any uh, passes any distribution nothing he's he just left alone kind of isolated up there and um that was the case again against his uh, Brazil mm-hmm. squad the, the the thing that I see, or I, at least for me, the, the biggest thing with Santi Jimenez is that when he's playing at Feyenoord, they play a very all-out offensive style, right? And he's always, or he's, he's, his demand from the coach is, um, you got to be up front, right? Like he, he rarely drops to provide defensive coverage. He rarely drops to pivot or whatever the case may be. He's always up front because the, the philosophy of the team is we go all out and attack. And he's always close to the box. And that's why he's a finisher. At Feyenoord. With Mexico, it's completely different. It's the opposite. They play on counter attacks and they try to play long balls and try to benefit the, you know, take advantage of the wingers using as a central striker or, or a central forward as a either pivot point or uh, a focus point for defenders to open up the, the wings. And that transition from, you know, that quick transition that Mexico tries to make from defense to offensive on a counter attack leaves a huge, huge spaces. And whenever and whenever they're not counterattacking, they're focusing on defense. He has to drop significantly, uh, you know, l- down on the pitch to either find a find a breakthrough or some link up play with with another winger. So he's completely out of his element, dude. He's not a striker who is known to be a build up player or known to be a you know easy to link up player. He's someone who needs to be in the box and needs to be a finisher or just close to the to the opposition's area so he can you know knock a goal. This is not this is this is not beneficial for him. Like I know that I understand that we want him to be the next big striker for Mexico, but we are not catering to him. Jimmy Lozano is not building the strategy around him. Jimmy Lozano is not making sure that he gets fed up. Uh, you know, I guess not, not fed up as, as in um, getting pissed, right? But pretty much getting feet a lot, a lot of balls, yeah. existence, and he's just not he's not gonna get it. He's just not gonna get it. 
especially with the, how they were lined up yesterday with um, Edson Alvarez as center back. A huge yeah. waste of Edson's talent having mm-hmm. him back there. And uh, that even contributes to the lack of distribution, the lack of connection between the midfield and the forwards, Santi specifically, because we know that Edson Alvarez contributed to a lot to that um, that connection, that distribution. So having mm-hmm. him a center back was a huge waste of his talent. I think he looked decent as a center back, but definitely that's not that's not his position and uh, not where you can have want to um, have him for La Selección at all. Um but yeah, man. I mean, three-two was the final score. Uh, that three, that last goal for Brazil was scored by Andrik. Right? That uh, oh, man. It, you know where he was left alone in the box uh, by Edson Alvarez. You know, I believe it was Edson that was yeah. covering him at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, Johan Vasquez got beat for the second goal really bad. Um, yeah. and, but uh, other than that, uh, was this an improved Mexico performance versus you know compared to the Uruguay, Uruguay match? So here's the thing. I think the score. Uh, casts a different spell on what happened on Wednesday. And what I mean by this is like, if you look at, if you only look at the score, you can say, all right, Mexico put up a good fight and it's a, it was a very close match. But when you actually look at the, you, you watch the entire, the entire game, you realize that almost, not almost, but I, I'm going to say like all goals from Brazil came in a, in a similar fashion, like the ones Uruguay scored against Mexico. Uh, they they exploded the le- the left flank of Mexico, which seems to be their weakest point so far. At least in the, in these last two matches, they've proven to be a sore spot for Jimmy Lozano's uh, uh, lineup, and I think it just shadows or casts this spell of yeah, they they may have improved, but let, let's be realistic about this. This is what Mexico showed up against Brazil is what we consider to be the closest thing as an A team, right? This is what we expect to see at the very beginning of Copa America. And the difference between this set of players and the ones against Uruguay is just that they look a little more coordinated, but there wasn't a huge bump in, I guess, performance, in collaboration, in just understanding what Jimmy Lozano wants to do. We continue to see a Mexican side with a huge lack of offensive creation, of, of offensive buildup, of offensive uh, work rate. Um, and it goes back to the point that you mentioned is the the fact that he's moving players to positions that, they, yes, they feel comfortable, but they're not where they excel, makes it more difficult for Mexico to make those breakups, man, because Edson Alvarez is supposed to be the link between the defense and the midfield. And if you look at, at every, at least on these two matches, but every single transition that Mexico made, there was a huge struggle because there's a huge disconnect between what the defense wants to do when breaking through and what where the midfield is at to make that breakthrough. So the fact that he's using Edson Alvarez as a center back, the fact that you have to use a center back as a right back in the name of Israel Reyes, is just makes and reshifts the, the, the lineup significantly to expose Mexico in so many different ways, right? Um, and I, I just cannot see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. Yes, it's an improvement in the sense that they at least scored two goals and they looked more coordinated. But overall speaking, um, we continue to see the same struggles. But this, this isn't a, this, this is struggles aren't something that we just found out last match. These right. are struggles that we've seen throughout Jimmy's tenure and even before Jimmy's tenure. It just right. goes to show that we have you know Mexico hasn't worked on the things that or, or haven't ha- they haven't worked on their weaknesses at all. Yeah, I mean, Santi Jimenez hasn't just been struggling for Jimmy. He was struggling before that. Mm-hmm. Um, the defense, you know, we've been we made a video maybe nine, eight nine months ago. Who's going to be the uh, the new right back, right? Um, and uh, it just something or left back, sorry. Uh, but even 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 now with right back with Raúl Reyes um, and Edson Alvarez playing, I mean, you, you're left questioning, like you said, why is uh, why are they two starting in, in those positions? And mm-hmm. um, I, I believe you had found out that. Uh, what Cesar Montes and uh, you know they, they were all struggling or picked up little knocks, right? Yeah, exactly. It look it looks like well, according to some pundits and some research that I did, is um, some of the Mexican players showed up with either small minor minor muscle injuries or just not match ready. They're not fit for exactly for like a ninety minute game. Yeah. So that's why we haven't seen Jorge Sanchez yet, or we're not going to see him. Maybe not even uh, starting at Copa America. That's the whole reason why Eton Alvarez was playing. Uh, uh, as a center back against Brazil because Cesar Montes is non match fit. And then lastly, you mentioned Charlie Rodriguez, which I think is a player that it's completely past his prime with La Selección Mexicana. Uh, I think he was, uh, I think he is a failed experiment from Tata Martino, and I don't think he should be called up again. Yes, he had a great season with Cruz Azul, 
but he's not a, uh, an L3 player. He doesn't show up like he does for his club. And the reason why he's playing is because Eric Sanchez, Chiquito Sanchez, is not match ready. It's not match fit. So what is going on? Is, is it something like, is Jimmy Lozano's staff not communicating with the clubs to make sure that, you know, they, they're distributing, distributing the, the training chargers or the training sessions more evenly so they don't have to deal with this? Um, wh why is he calling up players that are not match ready? Why is he, you know, filling up his squad with players that he cannot rely on? I don't know. There's a, there's a, there are a bunch of questions, but it just goes to show that what we mentioned on our, on our previous episode, there's no depth in this Mexican team. And even the, the players that we thought were good replacements are proving to be not the not the ideal solutions for for these gaps. Yeah, I mean, the lack of depth was on display again. And uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the Mexico fans were a lot happier with the result. Uh, I saw uh, on Twitter, it was the vibe was a lot happier and everything. Um, <laughs> had a couple friends that went to the match. They left satisfied. Stop Bro. going to the matches. Stop going to the matches. Exactly. Um, I agree. But... Uh, you have to look at the big picture here. This was against one of the tournament's favorites for sure, but it is one of the weakest Brazil teams of recent time. It was their bench um, that played against you versus your more or less A team. And uh, you still lost um, because of defensive errors more or less. But I think Brazil also, after they got the first goal, they took their foot off the pedal. After they got their second goal, again, they took off their foot off the pedal. And yeah. then as soon as Mexico tied, they went and got the third goal. Like it was nothing. Um, <laughs> so it could have been just Brazil not playing to their you know 100%. Their bench not playing 100, percent um, but uh, I, I think it was a, a good morale booster for Mexico. Uh, even though it's funny to say that because even though they lost, right? But uh, I think it was a good morale booster going into the tournament. Um, better than losing five one to Colombia, uh, but um, uh, yeah, it, it still leaves a lot more questions and answers. Who's going to be on that right side of the defense? Uh, who's yeah. going to replace Charlie Rodriguez? Is Charlie Rodriguez going to be your starting one of your starting midfielders for the tournament? Um, is Santi Jimenez going to be your starting striker? Uh, you give him a chance now. Chance, I want to say he was never fed really. Um, but uh, is Jimmy going to go back to his old ways and play him ten minutes a match? Um, a lot, <laughs> a lot of questions. Uh, is you know is the goalie Julio Gonzalez going to be the one that you really um, going to rely on, or are you going to go back to Tala? Uh, I, I don't know, man. I, less than two weeks for the Copa America and uh, these are things that maybe Mexico should have uh, except for the Tala Rangel and Julio Gonzalez thing and yeah. the injury to Malagón was unpredictable but the other things were things Mexico should have maybe figured out by now so, but for, for you and me this, these are all these questions that we have right we have so many questions there's so many doubts about this Mexican team but what I'm looking at you know when, when I look at Football Picante La Ultima Palabra like all these Mexican shows right and they make polls about asking, asking the fans hey do you think Mexico leaves you with more doubts after this match or no overwhelmingly fans say they have no doubts right they're, they're saying that after these two matches they don't have any doubts that mexico will go into the copa america and have a good performance what are they talking about who are they polling dude who, who are they asking these questions are, are, is the mexican fan so gullible to think that a 3-2 against brazil's bench it's a good parameter to say that mexico is going to compete against the likes of venezuela and ecuador and jamaica like i, I am genuinely worried that Mexico will not advance from the group stage. You know, in the 90s or early 2000s, every single time Mexico faced Venezuela or even Ecuador, you would, you would have laughed and say, yes, hands tied, we're going to beat them, right? We can sit down for 45 minutes, let them score tw two goals, and we're going to make a comeback. Nowadays, I'm not too sure. Venezuela is playing great. Ecuador has significantly improved from, the, from, from early 2000s. And even Jama Jamaica, who has proven to you that they can show up to Azteca and tie you on your own home turf. No questions asked. So, I don't know, man. To me, these two matches leave me with way more red flags. Like the fact that Mexico has received 12 goals in the last five matches. They have lost four out of the last five matches. And then on top of that, you bring someone like Julian Quiñones, who's supposed to be your X factor, right? Who's supposed to be your go-to player because he's turning up Liga Mekis and you... You you're bringing someone who's not Mex you know I guess he's not Mexican born and I don't have anything against it, but you're bringing him because he offers something that you cannot find on a Mex on a on a born or I guess whatever Mexican other Mexican players right. He was completely uneventful on both matches. Granted, and to be fair, against Uruguay he didn't play that much, but against Brazil, he didn't attack, he didn't defend, he didn't do anything, dude. He got anything. that goal. I mean, he, he got, I guess, <laughs> that to me, that was, <laughs> that's, but that, that to me is more, of, more like an own goal mm. rather than anything else. When, when you looked at the defensive transitions, even Arteaga was asking him like, hey, man, I need your help. I need your help covering me. Dude, he, the, the guy was walking, dude. And then when you see him on the offensive, he was completely lost. I don't know what's going on. I mean, to me, 
he needs to prove well not to prove but he he is the go-to player of this team it's not Santi Jimenez it's not really Antuna he is the one that brings in you know all the freaking cartels and all the freaking um like you know paraphernalia and everything. like the big hype machine comes behind him because he plays for America because he is a naturalized player because Six we know what Campeon Liga MX. exactly and he hasn't shown up for it and I worry that he won't he won't I yeah. feel he's playing like he did with Tigres because he's playing as a winger and his ideal position is behind a center forward or a striker. He could be Just that saying, missing piece dude. that distributes mm-hmm. to Santi Jimenez. Exactly. If mm-hmm. he was given that chance behind him. But yeah. uh, I mean, I, I doubt we'll see Jimmy switching from his favorite four no. three anytime soon, especially right r- one week before the tournament. But yeah. um now, Adrian, the crazy thing about this is uh, if Mexico does get out the group, um, if they win the group, they face Colombia, more or less. I think Colombia will probably Oof, be second yeah. in the group. If they lose, get second in the group, they'll face Brazil, the A-team. So a, a manageable group, I think. You, you said Venezuela, Ecuador, Jamaica. I mean, t- 10, 15 years ago, Mexico would have been, you know, no problem. We'll win this group with nine points. Um, but now, so it would be if they win the group, they would have to play Peru, Chile, or Canada. Uh-huh. Assuming Argentina wins the group, yeah. I mean, still not an easy task. <laughs> no. But, um, yeah, so these have been our, our reactions to Mexico, Brazil, USA, Colombia. One more match for USA on Wednesday against Brazil. But we're expecting to be an A-team Brazil. But after seeing uh, that uh, Colombia-USA match, I maybe Brazil comes in and says, you know, we'll play the match as well. Um, <laughs> give them minutes. But we'll see. At the end, man, as we wrap up this episode, bro, where can listeners find us, dude? They can always find us on YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, and turn on the notifications. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast on. Last but not least, you can also find us on Instagram and TikTok. We're posting stuff with more frequency. Check it out if you want to see some funny memes or just, you know, catch up with the latest on our videos or also some uh, the share of news of the USMNT, L3, MLS, and Liga MX. Yeah, so be sure to follow us. And uh, let us know in the comments what were your thoughts on uh, USA, Colombia, Mexico, Brazil. Uh, were you satisfied with Mexico's uh, last prep match before the Copa America? How dissatisfied were you with the USMNT's performance against Colombia? Uh, what do you think needs to be done? I know everybody's going to be calling for Triple G's head, rightfully so. <laughs> but um, don't blame you guys for that at all. Uh, yeah, let us know what your thoughts were on that. We like interacting with you guys there in the comments. Adrian, <laughs> I'll see you in the next one, brother. Take it easy, my friend. See you, Always a pleasure. See ya. See ya.